So we've talked about um, generating your description of, of, of your innovation and your intended um, intended implementation. And now we're going to talk about measuring and describing the enacted implementation. Um, the truth is that this can take so many different forms that it's all very context specific. Um, you're gonna to wanna to start with generation of the evaluation questions, kind of what are the questions I want to ask about my implementation? Am I at a stage where I want to understand better the, the did I implement as intended? Am I at a stage where I want to understand more short-term outcomes? Am I really keen on understanding the unintended consequences? Do I wanna capture all of it? Um, and that'll be determined by scope funding uh, effort. Um, evaluation questions, you know, they'll look to the work of Patton a little bit, who's done so much work in evaluation, but he would articulate that um, um, uh, they should be answered in a, in a reasonable time frame. So the question has to have a reasonable time frame attached to it and should be appropriate based on the cost. Uh, it is actually measurable and collectible. Um, and uh, it's important that it's not predetermined by the way you ask the question and that it's an actionable, that the answers that you acquire will be actionable. Um, you know, if I think about some questions related to fidelity of implementation, I would want to ask, you know, to what extent is my competence-based emergency medicine training program being implemented as intended? And for short-term outcomes, I'd want to understand the strengths and challenges of implementing competence-based education on the ground. And uh, I would want to know for, here's an example, you know, is the culture of assessment changing within our training program or not in the implementation of CPME? This is some example questions one might want to ask. And for each of your implementations, you can think of questions you might want to ask of your implementation. And then we really want to go out and measure stakeholder experiences and behaviors, gather data. And, um, and this there's not one data gathering mechanism that this, uh, this kind of um, uh, overarching methodology would, would imply. Um, one can use qual or quant or mixed methods. Um, uh, and that will depend a lot on scope, uh, feasibility, timeline, resources. Uh, as uh, Heather's articulated, the capacity to get you know, resources to do this on a big scale can be challenging. Um, but uh, if one can acquire those resources, that's great. Um, we certainly used um, uh, focus groups and interviews as being a very critical factor, but you may want to do, um, uh, oh my goodness, uh, what is the term for that? Sitting in on things. Um, it's not coming to me, it'll come to me later. Um, if there's an evaluation, qualitative evaluation scientist who can read my mind. That would be a good time to weigh in. Like field observation? Yeah, field observations and even deeper than field observations. Um, it'll come to me later on. Um, the process by which you might have someone sitting in a competence committee meeting for, you know, five competence committees taking notes. Field observations is, is, uh, is a form of it. But uh, anyways, I apologize. I can't come up with the term right now. You know, blame it on the COVID. Um, so, Okay. Yeah, so I'm gonna actually skip the last exercise because of timing, but the kind of goal here would be to figure out how one might go out and measure, uh, design your questions and go out and, and try to figure out how might, how might one measure what one is hoping to measure. Um, and in that process, again, one can use lots of different ways to do it. And uh, the way we're doing it with our rapid evaluation uh, studies for CBME is um, just uh, high quality focus groups with residents, faculty, competence committee members, all those individuals to understand their experience uh, across contexts. Uh, and then so lastly, once we've acquired uh, an understanding of what's happening on the ground, we're hearing the signals that Michelle is hearing. We're hearing our, you know, we were hoping that trainees would engage in this kind of behavior and it turns out, but now we're hearing that, um, um, that uh, our trainees are in fact uh, you know, gaming systems, only seeking an assessments at times that we were hoping that they weren't. Um, just looking at this as a tick boxing exercise that is frustrating for them. We want to compare the two and consider what kind of adaptations that we want to, we want to have. Because the reality is that we have this kind of ideal implementation, um, uh, but that the enacted implementation may be in fact very different. Uh, and so an example, um, here's an ideal you know, faculty will directly observe residents and give constructive feedback relevant to an EPA in the clinical context. And then you measure and you find out that faculty and residents find it challenging to initiate EPA assessments. So they don't complete them in person and they don't provide any specific feedback relative to that. And so we have these, these two uh, things which are in conflict. And now we want to go ahead and propose some adaptations. And so um, um, this can take multiple forms. In our context, this took the form of kind of a clear description of expected outcomes across all those elements. So describing all of our expected outcomes and then 
comparing that to our emergent themes and then specifically articulating what those adaptations will be. Um, um, I'll provide one example of this uh, for this purpose. So when we implemented CBME in Kingston at Queen's University Emergency Medicine Program, we did three month and nine month interviews with stakeholders. And it was immediately apparent that we switched from global assessments at the end of the shift to only EPA assessments at the end of the shift. And it was very clear from both stakeholder groups that there was real concern about the granularity of EPA focused assessment. And that really was resulting in a lack of overall global assessment and reassurance. And it had very quickly thwarted, which was a secret sauce at the end of emergency medicine shifts, whereby trainees and, and faculty sat down and went through it all as a, a real emergency medicine specific ritual that was actually harmed by the implementation of EPAs and removal of global assessment. There were some quotes that, that, were, that were brought out to, to exemplify that. And so our adaptation was bringing back global assessment. And so across emergency medicine training programs now, this has been a recurring theme uh, for those who remove global assessment and have been reintegrating global assessment into that training, into those uh, moments to capture that kind of, that moment that is so critical. Um, and so um, after one has acquired all of this information and data, the last step would be to disseminate the findings. And we've already touched on technical reports as a wonderful way to do that. Uh, when you disseminate a technical report that you're not confined by the restraints of peer review um, and the time that that takes, peer review is super critical, but really this is evaluation work. The stakes are, are only so high. We really want to just disseminate our findings, tell people about it. And so a well-articulated uh, summarized technical report can be very valuable and disseminated across stakeholders very quickly as soon as you have all the evaluation data that you're looking for. The other benefit of the evaluation, that process of comparing, that then engaging in adaptation, and then disseminating it back to stakeholders is that there is this incredible other desire effect around change management, which is that stakeholders now have been heard, they see that change is possible, and that they are far more potentially engaged in the processes moving forward. So I wonder if, you know, certainly if in, in my program, when I said, hey, residents, here's what we heard from you, and here's the adaptation, and your quotes, their quotes are all in there in the technical report, um, feeding it back, that provides a real level of transparency, a level of engagement. And I know that all of our residents and certainly others have had a similar experience. And that alone has assisted in any change management process uh, moving forward uh, to encourage stakeholder buy-in. Um, and then lastly, this process can be repeated at various intervals, um, uh, depending on, again, resources, capacity, and level of detail that one is uh, one is willing to engage in. So I'm going to uh, stop there. We have five minutes left for questions and I'm happy to hang around for a bit, but I wanna at least be respectful of everybody's time around the half hour. So um, I'll just say thanks to everybody. If anyone needs to take off, feel free, um, but uh, happy to answer questions and, and hang out and chat for a little bit uh, now. So thanks so much. Any questions? I'll just put my email up there. Um, I was gonna just make a quick comment. Yeah, um, thanks, Sue. Now, not doing program evaluation at all. It's quite different. We we built an intervention, which was this curriculum to disseminate in some um, actually cancer care programs in Africa. And then was like, well, what are we going to do with it? Um, and the goal of it was to come up with a curriculum that was flexible and that would actually maybe have an impact at the bedside. And so what we ended up doing was choosing to you, we made it in sort of a easy to break it apart, blah, 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 sort of, um, what do you call it? I can't remember the words like you can, um, and I don't have COVID, but you know, that sort of blended learning thing, asynchronous learning. Um, and so now what we're going to, the way we're going to, what we're going to use is it, we're going to use it to implement practice guidelines. And so really the implementation is the practice guideline and the tool is the curriculum. Um, and my comment really is that so much of what you're talking about to me as a non-educator um, really sounds like it's based on similar principles to quality improvement and, and implementation science. Yeah. And I can even think of frameworks like re-aim or um, particularly for measurement, like how would you come up with the right measurements or um, um, maybe something like CIFR for you know your whole kind of logic model and things like that um and this idea that it's iterative um obviously and for me just as a as a trying to get again have the traction that you all are trying to have this helps me think about a way to talk about what we did and to to actually back into a lot of the things that we did that seemed kind of like offhand 
but they actually were part of this 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 mechanism or this approach that you're talking about so that we can write it up in a way that's other people understand the language and there's a standardized format to it. So even if it seems small, um, the idea that you're using that that lingo and the con the way people talk about stuff, then you can share that stuff, I think, a lot more readily. So what I'm frustrated, you could tell I'm the oldest one here without a doubt, um, over all these years is like you're doing good stuff. And how do you put it together in a way that you actually can show your product and, 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 and then have exchange about it? And I think this is great. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, that's sharing your product and the exchange about it, I think is like, is such a, like a lot of, such a huge volume of clinician educators. Uh, all of us are doing all this great stuff. And it's really, it's easier than it's ever been, I think, but it's still very hard to like acquire the credit and disseminate ability and sharing and, and, and all that stuff for all the hard work that we do as educators. Um, uh, and so I think that capitalizing on, you know, um, on the ability to engage in, in, in even, even minor evaluation efforts can be really valuable to make something that is just innovation for one site and then, uh, and then allow it to uh, tell a broader message uh, and, a, and a disseminatable message. And then again, all the different kind of innovation reports and, uh, and, and you know, short reports and things like that, that that journals can take and would be keen to hear about are valuable technical reports uh, and then, uh, yeah, yeah, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it is a lingo and uh, I'm glad it's been helpful in some way for you. That's great. Other thoughts or reflections from others? Catherine? I, I would say, you know, an approach to program evaluation in a very expedient and efficient way is, is, is a core, core competency, I think, for anyone who's leading a program. Uh, we all, desperately need to know that we are achieving the goals that we set out to achieve. Um, and it's rather challenging actually to articulate them, organize them in the way that you showed in that grid and, and really drill down to what does this mean for every group of people that are involved in doing work in that program. And it's, it's a lot to think about. And I appreciate you breaking it down for us and um, giving us a an approach to do that. I think I will go back to those papers, you know, from time to time. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, interestingly, every program leader that I've sat down with, and many of which are not education scientists, they, they are really, they're like, you know, very practically focused program directors running a, running a program. And that's really critical, right? With a bit of like just the, having the time to sit down and articulate kind of by stakeholders. And it's hard to carve out that time in life, right? Um, each one has subsequently said that was actually a very valuable, not just for this evaluation effort, but to better understand what are these elements of my program and what I'm hoping to have uh, happening on the ground. Um, and you're right from a lens of if you want to get resources or create an argument for resourcing something, create an argument for um, getting assistance with something, the lens of this is critical for my training program from an accreditation perspective uh, does carry some teeth. So there is no program that engages in a robust evaluation process that then it has problems with accreditation. And now that's a bit general, maybe I'm wrong, but all I see is this is a feather in the cap of a program when it comes to accreditation time to say two years ago, <clears throat> we had a really good look at this. We articulated very clearly what the intentions of our training program were uh, in, this, in, this, in this realm. We then sought stakeholder opinion. Here's the report that we have from that and how it had our adaptations that we improved on. Certainly, I don't know if the CFPC has the same perspective, but I know that the Royal College's evaluation process is definitely changing to a process of like, so what are you doing to evaluate your program? Less tick boxy around the elements that need to be present. And I think probably the same is for the case for um, those that are crediting family medicine training programs. Okay. Yeah, if we each could, you know, from our own program, demonstrate that we've already gone through the process of evaluating ourselves and creating, you know, a task list and areas to improve um, in a continuous fashion, like that, that would really just be getting ahead of that, you know, accreditation. Absolutely. Process, which is, you know, yeah, not, not nearly as, as thorough as how you're doing. Well, no, and it doesn't need to be, I think, quite as thorough. The one thing I'll say is program evaluation, even to me, uh, and not even to me, but like to me still all the time is very intimidating. That's why leading a lot of program evaluation efforts, because there's a lot 
of methodologies which seem um, full of edge speak very, um, very difficult and unapproachable at times. And it's like, I can't do this without a scientist on my back helping me the whole way along. And I don't think it has to be that way. I think we can think of very straightforward ways to ask ourselves a question. You know, if this, this mechanism was boiled down, it would be like, what, what am I trying to do with this? What is actually happening on the ground? And what do I need to do to move towards that? Now that's very CQI. Um, the difference being that I think where we don't know exactly like where we're malleable in our efforts as far as what we're actually intending to implement. And we may need to change what we're intending to implement in response to what we learn about what we're implementing. That's a bit meta, I'm sorry. Um, but um, but it is, it's, it's, it's kind of fundamentally, it's blurring between QI and program evaluation, but program evaluation doesn't need to be as intimidating as I think it is for many people. Fantastic, thank you. Okay. Well, look, thanks a lot, guys. I really enjoyed hanging out with everybody for the day. Thanks for coming and hanging out with me for a little bit. Um, I appreciate it. And hopefully I can come down and we can go to the Aberdeen Tavern in what, like a year? Yeah. Half a year? <laughs> a few months, hopefully. Yeah. A few months. All right. Great. Perfect. I'll be there. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.